mean, you had to have a gimmick, you know. Ben Davidson had the handlebar mustache, and uh, you had to have some way um, to get your name in the paper. One of the most important things in our life, every Sunday morning that the Vikings play here, this town is Viking town. These players got wise to the camera, and they would look at the camera, and I don't know who the first one was, but somebody came up with, hi, mom. And everybody kept saying, hi, mom, hi. I don't know why nobody said, hi, pop. And I put some tape there. And if you came past that tape, I'd dunk you in the trash can, spit on you. I didn't want you down there. You were right headed. I didn't really, I didn't quit football to get into music. I quit football to quit football. The title of this show is The Me Decade, and it's all about the 1970s. Now, it might seem a little strange, uh, us doing a show about self-expression and the ultimate team game. Most coaches believe individualism is the football what termites are to houses. But in the 1970s, the sight of players spiking the ball or shouting hi mom to the camera became as much a part of the game as the national anthem. By the early 1970s, players were used to seeing our cameramen on the sidelines. But actually being on camera was another story. We tried to get close-ups of the players during games, but we couldn't use many of them because they were so conscious of the cameras. And then there were times they forgot they were on camera at all. That began to change with the advent of Monday Night Football. There were more cameras, celebrity announcers, lots of interviews, and an emphasis on FaceTime. Suddenly, being on camera meant being seen by a nationwide audience. And almost overnight, the camera-shy player was gone forever. These players uh, sort of got wise to the camera angles and they would look at the camera and I don't know who the first one was but somebody came up with hi mom and boy did that catch on hi mom hi mom hi mom hi mom hi mom and everybody kept saying hi mom hi. I don't know why nobody said hi pop but hi mom it didn't matter what the occasion players would find a reason to mug for our cameras Seeing our crews became an invitation to gain instant celebrity. What we lost in spontaneity, we gained in access. Players let our cameras get up close and personal. We began using wide-angle lenses during pregame, and it quickly became one of our trademarks. We had been using telephoto lenses for some time, but it was still a hit-or-miss proposition. For every one we hit, there were two that we missed. With the wide-angle lens, we could make players look larger than life. We began to use the wide-angle more and more, and we still use it a lot today. It gives drama to even the most trivial moments. If the 1960s taught us that change is inevitable, then the 1970s taught us how to live with that change. And it wasn't always pretty. For me, about the only thing that stayed the same was Abraham Abraham in Cleveland. The more film we researched, the more old Abraham turns up. I mean, look at this shot we found with 1950s icon Paul Brown. And look behind him. That guy looks like he just got out of Woodstock. It was that kind of time conservative past alongside an emerging future. They called it the me decade, and I can identify with that. It seems that everyone back then was looking for their place in the world. Football was supposed to be simpler than that. If you were a left tackle, then your place in the world was beside the left guard across from a defensive end. Individuality, well, that was, that was worse than communism. Coaches felt it killed team cohesiveness. But slowly, players began to do little things that set them apart. Now, 
I remember L.C. Greenwood with his gold shoes. Seems sort of strange that such a fierce guy would play with what looked like yellow bedroom slippers. Owners and general managers didn't want one player standing out, so many teams changed to color-coordinated footwear. Thinking this way, everyone could be nonconformist together. Some of the league icons of the 60s looked out of place in the 70s. I never could get used to Bubba Smith in Oakland. And to see the Packers' Carol Dale in something other than green, that seems almost blasphemous. Even worse was seeing Joe Cap in Boston. Cap was one of my favorite players, but his floating passes lost their magic with a losing team. We found this footage of Deacon Jones in San Diego, and it's the perfect case of the 60s fish out of water in the 70s. We wired Deacon in a preseason game during his second year with the Chargers. Two things were obvious. Deacon still had the same fire, and his teammates had none. Way to go, go King! That's the way to do it! Seeing Deacon with the 73 Chargers was like watching Spartacus trying to lead a Cub Scout troop. Hey man, look here. In this huddle, let's not be arguing. We'll stop him. Yeah, yeah, you keep your cool. If they move the ball on us, we'll stop it. Just play the defense. No arguing. We no arguing in here, okay? Just play the defense. This was also the first time I saw John Unitas in a uniform other than the Colts. Compared to Baltimore's basic blue and white, the Chargers uniform was a technicolor nightmare. Unitas' arm was shot, and he looked so out of place. It was a sad finish to a legendary career. In the history of NFL films, this is one of my favorite shots. Okay, I shot it. That's not the point. The hands of Dick Butkus are like a manual on how to play football. But that image was ruined for me in the 1970s. The Bears went to AstroTurf. I mean, Dick Butkus on plastic grass? It's like putting John Wayne on a mechanical horse. We wired Butkus for a preseason game in Buffalo. We had never miked him before, and we were really excited. Even at the coin toss, he was a fierce competitor. Look, Papa. You got to go. Asshole. But once the game began, Butkus was just a shell of his former self. Injuries had reduced this force of mass destruction to a mere mortal. Well, look at his knee. It's gone, man. Look at it. Damn. Is he knocked out or is his knee? We didn't use any of this because after two series, Dick knee? came out and he spent the rest of the game right. kidding around on the sidelines. You know what, yeah? Do you remember anything? No. <laughs> Butka seemed most concerned with the trials of rookie kicker Miro Roder. <laughs> You're all worried about that tee and uh, throwing your whole kicking off. Roeder was from the Czech Republic, and he was probably confused enough without Butkus's needling. Don't they have another tee? Well, what's happening? I don't know. I don't know if it's a tee or... How far did that one go? On a goal line. On a goal line. Yeah, but it was high. Is that tee as high as the one you use? I don't know. He put it... Well, can't you make it? Yeah, he put it... You had to win this way. You should have kicked it in the end zone this time. <laughs> She's all upset. Don't uh, don't get her upset. She didn't kick in the end zone. No, she didn't kick it in the end zone. She loses her tee and she can't fix another one. This turned out to be Dick Butkus's last season. He limped through nine games before his aching knees forced him to retire. His departure was the end of an era. I knew then that the pro football of the 1960s was gone forever. Another change we noticed in the 70s was the flamboyant fashions. These shots of the Oakland Raiders parking lot are just some examples of this newfound self-expression. Oakland's Art Toms was truly a sight to behold. Here he looks like a six foot five inch Amish pimp. 
Some people took art for a California hippie. Actually, he was from New Jersey. I'm not sure that Art would have fit in on a lot of teams, but in a Raider uniform, he seemed right at home. 30 years later, the car is still personalized, and Art is as irreverent as ever. His garage office includes a strange mix of artifacts from the 70s and collectibles of today. I was a little rebellious. I always thought it was funny that some of the guys would wear suits and they would bring briefcases. And I thought, why are they bringing a briefcase to a football game? I brought a little Snoopy lunch pail on the, the next way trip. And I put my toothbrush and an extra pair of socks and underwear and toothpaste in it. And it was kind of a mock uh, to make fun of those guys. And uh, George Blander didn't like it at all. The great thing about the Raiders was that all the owner cared about was winning. Al Davis set the precedence when he would bring in players that were uh, malcontents or dissidents on other teams. He would bring in players like that and wasn't that concerned about what they did off the field as long as they you know, showed up to practice on time, showed up for the games on time. On the Raiders, you had all sorts. The vertical stripes of Ken Stabler, the plaid designs of Gerald Irons. Here's my favorite, Jack Tatum with what looks like a pocketbook. I mean, Jack Tatum, the baddest cat in the game, the toughest of the tough guys, carrying a purse? Yeah, we were free to express ourselves, and it came out in many ways, whether it was our clothing or the length of our hair. Uh, I can remember uh, one time the Chiefs were coming in to play uh, the Raiders, and uh, uh, I w went over to the team bus as they arrived in the Oakland Coliseum. The guys started coming off the bus, and they all had these lasers with the, the Kansas City uh, logo on it, and they all had a tie, the same tie, <laughs> same shirt, and they're all clean-shaven, no mustaches, no beards. And um, I come up there with my full beard and uh, the torn jeans. You know, it was just such a, a contrast. My clothing and the long hair and everything was a reflection of the 70s, and we were allowed to do that. Tom's line mate was the man from Mars, Otis Sistrunk. Now, not only did they play together, but they hung out together, did appearances together, rode a limo to the games together. They called themselves Salt and Pepper, and the media, they ate this stuff up. You know, Otis Sistrunk, Art Toms, both defensive tackles, one black, one white, one bald, one with long hair. It was a Howard Cosell who was uh, big on Monday Night Football. And he used to play me up, and then Alex Karras used to play um, Otis Sistrunk up. I mean, you had to have a gimmick, you know? You had to have some way um, to get your name in the paper. I, I didn't fathom how many people knew who I was until after I really retired, and, and as time passes, that they still remember me and remember a lot of the, uh, the Raiders in the 70s. Once we introduced wide-angle lenses, certain players began introducing themselves to us. Ron Pritchard of the Bengals was one of those guys. Yeah, you gotta get me on some TV, man. Pritchard was such an exhibitionist that he took up pro wrestling in the offseason. True to form, he was thrilled when we flew to Houston to film his wrestling debut. He played for the Oilers at the time, so he was a big draw. Do you feel like a football player who is wrestling or a wrestler who sometimes plays football? Well, right at the moment, I feel like a football player who is wrestling and learning a great sport. I'm sure, though, in, uh, in years to come, I'll, I'll probably be taken over by wrestling. Roll one, Ron Pritchard, homosexual. Okay. This was before anyone was politically correct. And I'll admit that we got on him about his Speedo suit. Hey, give him the right Ron hand. played it up for us before his match against Pedro the Terrible. <laughs> he just slammed oh, that lock in there. Man. The only problem is, those lockers had built-in locks, and Pritchard slammed it shut without anyone knowing the combination. He ended up going home wearing his Speedo suit. With no judgment. <laughs> I, I want <laughs> God. Today, Pritchard's still in great shape, but his wrestling days are long behind him. Beep. 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 We set up our cameras at his home outside Phoenix to ask about Pritchard the football player 
and Pritchard the wrestler. Oh, man. I wish I had his strength still. Uh, I wish I had a 25-year-old body still as far as the strength, but, uh, you know, I, I love the, the idea of entertainment. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a ham at heart. Something is wrong. It's the intruder. Here to spoil Pritchard's debut. It will take all the cunning Pritchard has to deal with the dastardly intruder. The biggest thing that I was always told was, uh, you know, no matter what you do, the last thing you do before you leave the locker room to go on to the mat is go over again the start and the finish. What, what you do in between can be improvised, and, and you would. And one of the things that was important is I needed to respect their business. And, and so a lot of guys who come through the NFL have gone into wrestling on the off season and they got into very arrogant, running their mouths and things, and those guys got hurt. I mean, physically they got hurt, and their careers in wrestling wasn't going to last long because the guys couldn't trust them. Not only could they not trust them physically, that, that they might hurt them, but the idea of the, uh, they wouldn't trust them with the trade secrets. The big trade secret in wrestling at the time was known as juicing. You take a razor blade and you break the edge. Then you tape it on the end of your finger and then you'd cap it with another piece. And then when it was time to, to juice, you just roll it back, cut, squeeze, get that blood flowing. It looked like you was just, you know, cut wide open. But of course you weren't. People said, well, he's got the blood capsules in his mouth and he's carrying, you know, that ain't real. But that was real. That was real. And that, that's what I thought was neat about it. That you, you know, they'd go that far to get the effect. When we shot this, Pritchard insisted that everything was real. Well, we knew it wasn't, but we played along anyway. And then you settled down. This time, he filled in the blanks. He wanted me to gobble him up quicker. He wanted me to, uh, you know, take control is what he's doing. See, and generally when they take you in a headlock, like that, see, that's where they can really talk to you. All right, okay, listen, we're gonna, okay. you got it, you got it? Okay, listen, we're gonna, we're gonna drop, hit me twice, I'm gonna go after you, you got it. And you always say yes or no, if you don't have it, you hold on to it, I don't got it. I wouldn't want that same guy today. And I'm just being honest, back then he was more into himself and the things he was doing and what he enjoyed. And over the years in maturing, he's more into others now rather than himself. And that's a very important thing for me to have seen. All right. What was once a gaping wrestler is now a doting grandpa. Go open your mouth, hey! <laughs> hey, you know what I'm surprised? There was one time when I was playing with Houston and Kenny Anderson sprinted right. And I'm surprised this has never been on, the, on, the, on these uh, real good hits. I threw a forearm under his chin, and his helmet blew off his head about 20 feet. This is the truth. Cut his tongue in half. We spent several days looking for that shot of Pritchard decking Kenny Anderson. Turns out, it was actually Virgil Carter. The only problem is that we have Pritchard bearing down on Carter, but once he throws the pass, our top cameramen are trained to follow the ball. So we missed the hit entirely, and even when the action returned to the area, he was still on the ground, so we missed him again. In those days, we sent only one camera to most of the games, so there was no ground camera to record the hit. The best we could do is show a bloody Carter leaving the field. His tongue, they sewed his tongue up at halftime, and he played the second half and beat us. I got 15 on it, you know, but... I said, what a great shot. He juiced. He juiced. Yeah, naturally. There was one place the me decade didn't seem to reach. Bloomington, Minnesota. Now where else did ice skating preclude football on the stadium turf? We were amazed at the sheer will of the Vikings fans. It would be 12 below, but each Sunday, the campers would roll in, the beer would be packed in snow, and the pregame tailgate parties wouldn't miss a beat. Our cameramen loved to shoot this stuff because there was nothing else quite like it. The game was not the main reason you were there. It was to see your friends, meet some players. It's a family event. Bob Lertzema was the fifth man on the Vikings' famous front four. But number 75's ability to laugh at himself and his rapport with the Vikings fans made him a local hero. Even today he's still up there, a testament to fans who prefer a regular guy to a regular starter. You have to realize that one thing about tailgating, 
You had all week to talk about it. You, and, and at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock Sunday morning, you had to be underneath the Cleveland Indian sign with your devil legs. And the whole week build up, they were building up for the tailgate party. Now, now there's your cake. I mean, you got three hours, four hours of tailgate with your friends, 10 times a year, it's awesome. Now, if you win the game, here's your icing on the cake. Now, I thought about retiring. I said, I'll just be a fan. I mean, this is more fun than a game. Viking football to us is one of the most important things in our life. Every Sunday morning that the Vikings play here, this town is Viking town. Not only that, we even provide the beautiful cold weather for it. We have an air-conditioned stadium, and I hope we could keep it that way because the Viking fans warm it up. We found this old footage of Vikings tailgates, and we still can't get over the sheer volume of the food. Look at all this stuff. One other thing that made Met Stadium unique was the music. Not many tailgate parties had their own bands. The mellow sound of the 70s was the perfect way to be hip without actually being hip. Sometimes the music was contemporary. Most of the time, it wasn't. We worked the parking lots to gather material for a study on American tailgating. But after a few hours at the Met, we realized that in no way did this reflect the rest of tailgate America. I mean, look at these people. looks like a cross between Fargo and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Now the cabaret is back on Broadway, maybe this guy has found steady work. These days, the Vikings play downtown and there isn't much room for tailgating. But we figured that if we went to the old stadium site, which is now the Mall of America, and set up a tailgating party, all the old tailgating faithful would return. You know, grill it and they will come. We rented out the parking lot of the Thunderbird Hotel across from the old Met. We had plenty of beer, plenty of sandwiches. We had our own parking staff. The only problem, nobody showed up. So Todd, yes. What exactly was your idea here today? My idea here today was to recreate the spirit of the Vikings tailgate party circa 1972-73 by having a party outside the parking lot of Mall of America. And obviously this is the worst idea I've ever had so in here, my life. So you, what, what are you saying, that no one's here? I'm saying that nobody's here. Fire up that old Fairmont of yours and uh, come out to the back parking lot of the Thunderbird. It got so bad that we had to put our catering guy in charge of getting out the fans. Yeah, you gotta wear your Viking stuff though. Paint the face. Paint the face. Yeah, paint your face, get butt naked and run around. <laughs> I don't care. The Thunderbird, anything goes. <laughs> oh, you guys see somebody way down there. There's yeah. a car over there. Check that truck. Hey, you know, maybe we're in the wrong spot. Wait, there's a guy here. We need park around here, you got a good spot? Well, a beautiful day for town, you 32 degrees, perfect. But, but you're the only one here, Bob. Well, you know what happened. I, uh, for so, showing many, up. so many people are waiting outside. I, I cut in front of them. They got them all stopped. There's thousands of people waiting to come to this party. But apparently, security won't let them in. See, there you go. So, uh, yeah. In retrospect, we should have promoted this thing a little better. But hey, we're filmmakers, not party planners. And later that night, there were real live ex-players and fans at the annual Minnesota Players Alumni Dinner. And like always, the man of the people was at the podium introducing the Hall of Famers. I'm going to introduce some of the players. Uh, first of all, I want to start out uh, with the worst coach in the National Football League. Uh, he was 0-4 at the Super Bowls. But we love him, the greatest man, the greatest coach ever in the National Football League, Mr. Bud Grant. Bud! We were part of a family. What, we weren't playing for money because the money wasn't that good. They could identify with us because they knew we loved the game so much. And we would probably have played for nothing. And now, from the meatpacking and proctology capital of the world, downtown Buffalo, this is Roll One of OJ and Company. All right, well, we have a very young team. Our whole backfield 
At least Our 1969 interview session in Buffalo was mainly to get sound bites from the Bills' rookie running back. But we also met rookie quarterback James Harris. Harris was about to open the season as the Bills' starter, and he helped bring quarterbacking into the modern era. Uh, since I've been here, everybody's been real nice to me. I haven't encountered any problems whatsoever, and uh, there seems to be no uh, problems other than my performance is what's going to determine whether I'll be accepted or not. The face of quarterbacking was changed forever in the early 70s as more and more teams allowed talented black passers to line up under center. Before Harris, there was Marlon Briscoe of the Denver Broncos. Briscoe was 5'9 and was drafted as a cornerback, but he threw 14 touchdown passes as a rookie. We'll never know if Briscoe had a future at quarterback because no one else would give him a chance, so he spent the 70s as a wide receiver, mostly for the Bills and Dolphins. We visited Briscoe in Los Angeles to talk about the road he helped pave but never traveled. Racism did play a part, but I think that uh, the fact that the black athlete was perceived just as that, that an athlete that could uh, adapt to another position. Briscoe's roommate in Buffalo was Harris, one of the first African-American passers actually drafted to play quarterback. Harris had a rocket launcher for an arm, but he never seemed to pan out in Buffalo. During that era, they would always use some reason, a negative reason, to criticize the quarterback. In my case, I was too small, or that I was a runner. In James's case, they said he threw too hard, you know, that you know, a lot of the players couldn't catch his ball. Hey, I caught his ball. Halen Moses caught his ball. We had, no, we had no problem with catching his ball. We were happy when Harris got a fresh start in Los Angeles. And we thought the stigma against black quarterbacks would be shattered forever when he led the Rams to three straight division titles. Soon, there was J.J. Jones in New York, Dave Mays in Cleveland, Johnny Walton in Philadelphia, and Parnell Dickinson for the expansion Buccaneers in 1976. But we had a hard time finding these shots because none of these guys got much playing time. They weren't going to get an opportunity to play. And it was pretty much window dressing to give them, to draft them, stick them on, uh, on the third team, or, um, you know, and eventually, you know, they would uh, find themselves out of the league. One guy who did get a chance to play was Jefferson Street Joe Gilliam in Pittsburgh. This was when Terry Bradshaw was still developing and Gilliam's talent was just too great to ignore. Little bitty skinny guy with terrible feet. I mean, he always complained about his feet hurting. I would see him hanging, I remember Joe Gilliam hanging from the, from the goalpost to get the, and he was saying he'd getting the weight off his feet and just be hanging there, stretching out. The knock on Gilliam was that he couldn't read defenses. But we knew he could. His father was a college coach, and he grew up with a passing game. Gilliam just had a gunslinger mentality that backfired at inopportune moments. Gilliam's game wasn't exactly a Pittsburgh type of game, I guess. So he had a lot of pressure on him, and he had, I think he had sort of parental pressure, and he had uh, team pressure, and he had uh, town pressure, and uh, he just couldn't deal with it. Despite starting off with a winning record in 1974, Gilliam was benched in favor of Bradshaw. And unlike James Harris, he never recovered from the demotion. I don't know whether the Steelers giving up on him as a quarterback uh, was the chicken or the egg, or whether the drugs, you know, which came first, the losing the job or the drugs. And I tried to find out about it. I thought it was cocaine, which was, you know, people back in those days, people were doing recreational cocaine. But it turned out it was heroin, and that, well, I guess that will impact upon a quarterback. We found this shot of Gilliam against Oakland. Look at the respect he had, even from the hated Raiders. But by 1975, Gilliam was out of football. He was an unhappy guy after that and, and, um, and never could get, stay off uh, from what I would hear and read. He never could stay off heroin for long and, and died of an overdose, I guess. Whenever I think about Joe Gilliam, I think about what could have been. For every hundred players who enjoyed the limelight, there were those who just wanted to be left alone. Dwayne Thomas didn't talk to the media, 
to the fans, or any of his teammates for that matter. He was easy to find on Sundays. Just look where no one else was. Maybe he should have joined the Oakland Raiders, football's halfway house, and home to number 26, Skip Thomas, a man they called Dr. Death. Skip didn't like reporters, and cameras made him uncomfortable, ours included. He only talked to people he trusted, and that meant mostly to his roommate, Jack Tatum. It was through Jack that we finally located the reclusive Mr. Thomas. Don't pay him no attention. He's crazy. <laughs> We wanted to make Skip as comfortable as possible, so we picked a site close to his home in Kansas City that was suitable for a man called Dr. Death. What did you think when he said, we're gonna meet you in the graveyard and shoot the interview? I thought he's crazy. <laughs> At first, and then I thought about it. Well, Dr. Death, now after all this time, we're doing an interview. Yeah, seems strange. <laughs> Tell you what, you wouldn't have got it unless Jack told me that, uh, he said, yeah, you say, okay, go on and do it. Just don't beat him up afterwards. Just getting Thomas to talk was a coup. He had done just two interviews in his life and felt shafted both times. What, what did they like about the writer? They lied. They tried to they bait you into saying something and turn it around the other way. The press knew better than even come down. I, we used to be at a, a corner of a locker room. You know, they had us in the corner. And I put some tape down. And if you came past that tape, I'd dunk you in the trash can, spit on you. I didn't want you down there. Man, I was the biggest defensive back there was. First of all, how'd you get the nickname? Well, it started from Bubba. Bubba Smith and Bob Brown. I guess I did strange things. So what kind of stuff, what kind of strange things, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, well, I'd get up in the morning, I wouldn't comb my hair, maybe. Get out there at practice and, uh, I'd be pissed off at Madden, and instead of uh, knocking a pass down or something like that, I'd take and kick at it like I was playing soccer. And they just said, leave Doc alone and uh, everything will be all right. He'll be there to play Sunday. And I never missed a game. Nobody really said too much to me. The only person who really talked to me was Jack. George, you know, Upshaw when he got pissed off at me. Or art. If I was doing something that I shouldn't be doing, you know, staying out real late at night, uh, drinking a lot. I mean, you know, like I would sit on the on the sideline, you know, like we'd be playing, and I'd sit there on the sideline. I'd be by myself, you know. I'd go down, way down on that end down there. Watch. I don't know if I was watching the game or thinking about what could I do to hurt somebody, you know, to make him think about me a little bit more or something, you know. Lucky for Skip, the Raiders weren't into conformity, and Skip could just be Skip. If Coach really had something to say, and he thought it was important, he'd tell Jack. And then Jack would relay it to me. Well, wasn't really nothing for us to talk about as long as I was there on Sundays to play. I mean, you know, we teased each other every now and then. I guess some of the things I did in practice, he, he thought maybe, maybe he thought if, I, if he said something to me, then I'd start screwing up. See, because they always wanted me to catch the balls. You know, instead of knocking them down, just taking them and knocking them down or kicking at them, something like this, he wanted me to, to practice intercept it. And I'd always tell him, pay me. In 1978, Thomas faced the ultimate career challenge, life away from the Raiders. So you, walk, you get to Buffalo and they find well, you? Well, for Buffalo, I let Buffalo, Buffalo had their own thing. I don't even talk about Buffalo. That's like a nightmare for me. So we won't even talk about Buffalo. If Buffalo is something that I would never wish on anybody at that time. Basically, you got to wear hair, wear ties and jackets and all of that. And I wasn't in all that. So I was only there for like two hours anyway. Skip was a real lost treasure, and we're glad we tracked him down. But we discovered why this was only his third interview ever. Skip's a world-class cursor. My four-letter words come out more than I wanted to. Man, that was uh, that was messed up. Sometimes I don't even know if I'm saying it. Man, you hit that in his mouth. You got backups. Don't let us down. Don't let no come in here and steal money out of our pocket. Oh, yeah, y'all are really the real bad. Y'all better, better find some kind of way to come on with it. I hope his family was a lot better than he was, because may not live to get off this. I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't mean to, because before it just comes out. I've been doing it all my life. Ever since I left high school, I've been, hey, hey, that's how come I don't talk to people.
One of the things that really changed in the 70s was player movement. Guys would play with three, four, and sometimes five different teams. And this was before free agency. Take John Matusa. He went from Houston to Kansas City to the Oakland Raiders. He even spent a day in the WFL. Then there was Mike Adamley. You might know him as a broadcaster, but here he is with Chicago. There he is with the Jets after he started his career in Kansas City. They gave him number one. I have no idea why. He ended up being the last running back ever given a jersey number under 20. Carl Garrett was with Boston, the Jets, and finally the Raiders. Now, Carl Garrett isn't to be confused with number 20, Mike Garrett, who played with Kansas City and San Diego. There was Gene Washington in Denver with great speed, and Gene Washington in San Francisco with great hands. Ken Burrow, the receiver in Atlanta, wasn't to be confused with double O Ken Burrow in Houston. Perhaps the poster child for all this player movement was defensive end Coy Bacon. Now there he is with the Rams, then San Diego, then Cincinnati, and finally the Redskins. There's this popular game on the internet called The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, which links movie actor Kevin Bacon to every actor who ever lived. So we thought we'd try it with Coy. Call it The Six Degrees of Coy Bacon. We took our idea on the road to check with both our inspiration as well as the father of our company. First question, do you have any idea why we're here? No. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? You've never heard of that? No. You don't understand what this is? Oh, geez, so what's wrong with you, Phil? What the hell are you talking about? How did you come up with anything like this? I didn't come up with it. Oh. It's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Six degrees? Yeah. Yeah, Kevin Bacon, yeah. Okay. My cousin. <laughs> so you want me to connect my career with six points? No, I'm explaining. Uh, so do you understand? The okay, you explained it. Next. Let's try an easy one. Joe Namath. Okay, Bacon played alongside our old friend Fred Dreyer with the Rams. Now we found these shots of Fred sacking a guy named Hunter, who by the way was the character he ended up playing on television. Dreyer played with Namath, also with the Rams. So that connects Bacon to Namath. Okay, how about today's players? We'll try Kurt Warner. Warner was teammates with Rick Tootin in St. Louis. Tootin goes back to the 89 Eagles where he played with number 49 defensive back Todd Bell, who broke in with those great Bear defenses, playing right behind linebacker Wilbur Marshall. After leaving the Bears, Marshall went to the Redskins where he was teammates with Art Monk. Great with him. Uh, would you watch the rest game? Coy Bacon was a football player, wasn't he? We wanted to find the most obscure player we could and see if we could link him to Coy. Now, this book has everybody who ever played in the NFL, and we're just going to pick someone at random. Um, okay, here we go. Army Tomaney. And he played just eight games with the New York Giants in 1945. Army Tomaney. Now that's just about as obscure as you can get. Okay, here we go. Bacon played with John Unitas in San Diego. And he tried his best, did his best. Who did Coy Bacon play for? Unitas played with Art Donovan in Baltimore, who played with Frankie Filchok, who played on the 46 Giants with John Weiss, who played with Tomaney in 1945. Who? You're using up a lot of valuable film there. How about a real challenge? Maybe the greatest American athlete ever, Jim Thorpe, who played in the 1920s. Think we can do it? We can do it. Now, Bacon played with number 41, Ron Smith. Smith later played with the Raiders alongside George Blanda in 1974. Now, if you're going to go way back to the 20s, you need Blanda, because he played with Sid Luckman and the 1949 Chicago Bears. Luckman takes you through fellow Bears George Musso and Joe Zeller to the 1932 Packers. Zeller played with Paul Fitzgibbon. Fitzgibbon played with Thorpe on the 1928 Chicago Cardinals. I know, that's seven. But we tried and we just couldn't get it done in six. The best we could do is the seven degrees of Coy Bacon. And hey, that's not bad when you're going all the way back to Jim Thorpe. Now why don't you try it at home? And here are a couple rules. First of all, no coaches. That just makes it too easy. And Pro Bowls, All-Star Games, they don't count either. And if you really want to make it tough, toss in what we call here 
the Latrobe Clause. And that means you can't use any quarterback from Pennsylvania. And that's Marino, Montana, Unitas, Namath, or George Blanda. So, so now I can tell you it's not my idea. It's Todd Schmidt's idea. Where's Todd? <laughs> that's a dog, Todd. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it sucked too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so don't blame it on me. <laughs> well, I was waiting to see if, uh, what your reaction I don't know what the hell that is. <coughs> okay. That's what you call reaching. Throughout the 70s, we saw a new wave of athletes, educated, refined, and sometimes ambivalent to pro football. Mike Reed, number 74 of the Cincinnati Bengals, was part of that wave a two-time Pro Bowler with a lethal combination of size and speed. Oh, quickness. I, if you're going to beat a guard, if I'm going to beat a guard, I'm going to beat him in the first step I take. Yeah. But like many young men of his generation, Reed yearned for more. And while he liked football, it was not his true passion. It wasn't like selling insurance in the off-season like other players. Reed studied classical music at Penn State and was an accomplished pianist. He was an All-American and first-round draft choice in 1970. But, you know, he may have been a better musician than football player. After his rookie year, we filmed Reed playing in a concert with the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Now the left hand. Wait before the rest. Just wait. Some musicians wait their whole careers for a shot like this. I got him right there. And Reed Saturday had earned it at 23. <laughs> I'm going to be sitting there and I'm going to say, when is he going to let me play that note? You know you're talking about an unusual player when the news that he was named Rookie of the Year is announced at one of his performances. And the announcement is made by the conductor. This was the first concert NFL Films ever shot. We filmed all kinds of shows since then, from Journey to Macy Gray to Kiss, even Marilyn Manson. But it all started right here with Mike Reed. We wanted to interview Mike again for this film, but he's so focused on his music now that he's reluctant to talk with anyone about his football career. So we went back to some outtakes from interviews we did with him in the 1980s. Eight years after Mike retired from the Bengals, the memories of why he enjoyed the game were still fresh in his mind. My whole motivation was excitement. I mean, I, I, probably, I probably got out there and pounded my fist and drooled on my uniform, you know, with the best of them. But underlying the whole thing was always the fun. I mean, it was always, always a lot of fun. You know, look at those uniforms. It's like coming out six years old on Christmas morning, isn't it? Look at all the colors and look at the eagles and the birds and tigers and lions. You know, it's all designed to be fun. Mike Reed was different. He was a cultured, sensitive man whose intellectual nature didn't quite mesh with his teammates. What are they doing? Are they going to quit running or what are they going to do? Mike, all I can tell you is hot. Very hot out there. For all the fun he had, the demands of playing in the NFL wore on Reed's body, as well as his mind. He began questioning the game and his role in it, and ultimately decided that he had to make a change. I, I didn't really, I didn't quit football to get into music. I quit football to quit football. When I sensed that it just started to stagnate emotionally, that's the reason I got out. I was never into the Spartan life. I was never into the sense of, of play of football players as uh, as the great noble gladiators. When you when you stop playing football, it, it, it's an interesting thing that you learn. Uh, as a, as an athlete, as a football player, at the time of the game, you really have suffer the under the illusion. You live in the illusion that what you're doing at that moment is of great importance. And it's a shocking thing when you stop playing to realize that it doesn't mean anything, really. Normally, I'd be inclined to argue that last point, but I'll save that discussion for another show. Reed retired in 1975 and devoted all of his energies to music. 
He settled in Nashville and became one of country music's top songwriters. He's won two Grammy Awards and written 17 songs that went to number one on the country charts. You have to think Mike was right. Music was his true calling all along. The combination of music and football throughout my life has been more of a mystery to other folks than it has been to me. The hulking beast soothing his savage soul <laughs> for money. <laughs> The emotional thing, the emotions of these two things are not that, they're pretty similar. I loved being an athlete. I'm very proud that I was an athlete, but it didn't, it just simply didn't define exclusively what I, what I am. Music, the, the love or to be touched by great music does not require intellect. It just does it to me. It just gets me in ways that I can't ever explain. Most people are lucky to succeed at just one thing, but going from an all-pro lineman to an award-winning songwriter, Mike Reed knows that he's done something special. I'm hearing them on the radio and then being nominated for Grammys and all. It did kind of indicate that, uh, that maybe there are second acts in American life, you know. To me, Mike Reed's quest for happiness symbolizes the whole decade. He didn't waste his talent but used it to help him find his place in the world. More and more, football became part of a man, not the sum of him. Now, I want it known that it's 11.06, and so people who are six minutes, people who are fashionably late aren't here yet. That's right. They're fashionably late. They'll be here at, at, in 20 minutes, 11.26. The beer will be here. The sandwiches will be here. So I say in 20 minutes or so, we're going to have a really rocking party. <laughs> Well, that was Golden Bob Lurtzman was going to be here. Hello, <laughs> 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 you want some beer? You the sample crew? Are you the sample crew? I've been attacked already. Check that. Come on over. Hey, yeah, we got two Come on over. Yeah, yeah, free beer, yeah, come pop, on. Come food. Come on. It's legit. Come on. Good day. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. What are you doing here? Well, we're desperately trying to have a tazzy party with no football, but it didn't actually work out. So help yourselves. Have a sandwich. Have a beverage. Show. Enjoy. Bob Lurtzman is here, but uh, unfortunately, very few people came, so we figure you guys were having the, the seminar in there, so you figured right. you'd, you'd come join us. Great. <laughs> well, Pop, for some sandwiches? You sure? All right. Yeah, I'm Bob. Yes, I, I recognize you. Come on over. You can use a brewski here, Pop. Come on. Come on. There's no, no gimmicks. Not a gimmick in the world. Come on over. Bob, of course I recognize you. I'm one of those football, baseball fans, whatever. Are you? Well, good, good. Yeah, how are you? Oh, you bet. Good seeing you. I'll tell Scotty you love his bar. <laughs> I could just see my career crumbling. Wait, wait, wait. wait.